uh, the humanity of all people, regardless of color or race. Malcolm embraced this definition of Islam, and building from it, came to the realization that the underlying tension and the fundamental challenge between people throughout the planet was not based on color, it was based on class. Malcolm said at the end of his life, all my life I used to believe that the struggle was between white and black. Now I understand, he said, that the, the, the fundamental struggle is between the haves versus the have-nots. So Malcolm X charted a path challenging structural inequality and economic injustice. That, and that was his message to the masses of blacks in the United States. It was a message that many middle-class African-American leaders have been afraid to embrace because of its revolutionary character. Malcolm was assassinated uh, in, in part to silence the kind of evolution and the radicalism that he was undergoing. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated three years later because he was undergoing a similar kind of transformation. That Dr. King came out against the war in Vietnam. He called for a poor people's march on Washington, D.C. to challenge the Johnson administration's failure to address the continuing burden of poverty in the society. Martin called for uh, the need to internationalize the struggles of African Americans and to reach out to progressive people throughout the world to put pressure on the U.S. government for its unjust domestic and foreign policies. So he ends up being assassinated. So there is a long tradition in the United States of either assassinating black leaders or silencing them by stripping them of their citizenship rights or their right to travel, taking their passports away. This is what occurred in the 1950s with Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois, the founder of the NAACP, and the great Paul Robeson, who was a great artist and singer and actor, whose pa both of their passports were t denied to them for seven or eight years. They were stripped of their right to travel throughout the world. Uh, their income plummeted. And so there is this official, they were made non-persons, very much like under the, the old Soviet Union uh, of what occurred with people like uh, Sakharov and Solzhenitsyn. So we have in the United States political prisoners that remain today incarcerated. We also have um, uh, the disproportionate number of people who are in prison. Uh, are very low-income people, and the criminal justice system works as a way of warehousing the unemployed. Uh, of those 2.3 million people who are in prison, most of uh, either about a third of them were unemployed at the time of their arrest, and the others average less than $20,000 annual income in the year prior to their arrest. So the vast majority of people who are incarcerated in the U.S., regardless of what they've been charged with, are poor people. Uh, and they are disproportionately brown and black, but, uh, you know, they are poor people. And, you know, so that the, the country continues to function in a way to suppress legitimate dissent. So this is part of the why Malcolm is so important, because he symbolizes in many real ways a break with this kind of both white supremacy and economic injustice. Uh, your book on Malcolm X uh, is titled A Life of Reinvention. Uh, what kind of reinvention are you talking about? Malcolm continued to remake himself throughout his life. He was born Malcolm Little in Omaha, Nebraska. He, during the course of his life, he underwent a series of changes when he was a teenager, uh, his nickname was Detroit Red. He was involved in urban crime. He was a, you know, kind of a small petty gangster in Harlem during the 1940s. He was imprisoned for seven years uh, for several robberies. Uh, during his life in prison, he experienced uh, an epiphany um, 
where he, or Metamorphosis, where he joined uh, a sectarian uh, semi-Islamic uh, group, the Nation of Islam, which combined elements of traditional Islam with kind of black separatism, headed up by uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He became a devotee of this organization when he was released from prison in 1952. He, became, he emerged rapidly as a major figure within the group. He personally helped to establish over 60 mosques throughout the United States uh, from 1952 to 1962. But at, in the course of his development, he came to realize the contradictions and problems inherent in this sectarian group, and also the hypocrisy and, and the uh, contradictions of the leader uh, who had engaged in extramarital affairs and also uh, and corruption. And so Malcolm broke from the organization, uh, building his own groups, uh, Muslim Mosque Incorporated, which reached out to uh, the Sunni community, and uh, the Organization of Afro-American Unity, a secular group that attempted to mobilize uh, African Americans, regardless of their faith or religion, to engage in political struggle with the state, with the government. And this was really where Malcolm was going at the end of his life. So there are a series of changes. That's why the subtitle of the book is The Life and Re of Reinvention. The uh, listeners may want to access my website on Malcolm, which uh, documents many of the interviews I've done. It's www malcolm x project that's one word malcolm x project dot net and uh, you can see many of the interviews and a lot of film clips and photographs of malcolm x excellent thank you um, well that was an era of great black leadership many of them uh, were prominent and saw the problems of that time um, what is left of this uh, black leadership well today the best example of black leadership is Barack Obama, who is currently uh, the leading candidate for the Democratic nomination for president in the 2008 election. That it's a different kind of black leadership. It's what I call post-black black leadership, in the sense that Malcolm X and Dr. King had constituencies, their core constituencies consisted of African Americans. The same thing is true with Jesse Jackson, who ran for president in 1984 and in 1988. Jackson did reach out to whites in 88 in a very dramatic way, but nevertheless, the core of his vote consisted of blacks. That is not true with Barack Obama, even though approximately 90% of all African Americans who are voting are supporting his candidacy. That was not true a year ago, where Hillary Clinton actually had a majority of black support of, in her competition with Barack Obama as late as December or January of this year. Um, the Clintons really lost black support because of the um, racially unfair and um, um, hypocritical way that they ran their campaign of the uh, kinds of attacks on Barack Obama, as well as the statements made both by Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton most re recently, several days ago, that seemed to imply that she would benefit from the assassination of Barack Obama. Um, that appalled and astonished millions of African Americans throughout the United States. Now, I understand that this was not her intent by the statement that she made regarding uh, the death of Robert Kennedy in 1968 and drawing an allusion to that with Obama. I'm sure that she means him no physical harm. Nevertheless, she continues to run for presidency because she anticipates that something will disrupt Obama's camp, uh, campaign for the presidency. And one of those things that people have speculated widely about is his assassination. Given the history